Do you accept, Mr Cameron, that the health budgets over the time of your government were inadequate and led to a depletion in its ability to provide an adequate service? Um, I, I don't accept that, um, neither on a sort of big picture level or yes. on a small picture level. I mean, the big picture level, I don't think you can separate the decision and the necessity of getting the budget deficit down and having a, a, a reasonable debt to GDP ratio so you can cope with future crises. I don't think you can separate that from um, the funding of the health service or indeed anything else. I mean, if you lose control of your debt and you lose control of your deficit and you lose control of your economy, you end up cutting the health service. That's what happened in Greece. That's what happened in countries that did lose control um, of their finances. So I don't think you can separate the two. So we made the important decision to say that the health service was different, its budget would be protected, and so there were real terms increases every year. And so, for instance, there were 10,000 more doctors working in the NHS at the end of the time I was Prime Minister than there were at the beginning. Um, <laughs> would everyone like to spend even more on the health service? Yes. There were, I mean, I, you know, making these difficult choices about spending was, was it wasn't a sort of option that, that was picked out of thin air, I believed, and I still believe it was absolutely essential to get the British economy and British public finances back to health, so you can cope with a future crisis. The, the inquiry has received witness statements from Jeremy Hunt, who was uh, the Secretary of State for Health uh, and then Health and Social Care from 2012 to 2018. Um, were you aware uh, that during the time that, that you were in power, Mr Hunt um, laboured considerable concerns about the structural problems within a NHS capacity and the workforce and funding, as he has set out in his witness statement. I, I've read his witness statement. I, he was a, a very capable health secretary. I worked with him extremely closely. Um, of course, he was always um, batting for the NHS and for, um, for, for all the extra resources he could get. Um, these decisions were arrived at collectively. Um, I agree with a lot of what's in his witness statement, uh, you know, where he says there's more that could be done for, for instance, for future workforce planning. But I will absolutely defend the record of the government in both getting control of the finances and increasing funding for the health service at the same time. Aren't these concerns, Mr Cameron, uh, that, that Jeremy Hunt sets out, structural problems with the NHS uh, and workforce and capacity, the real issues which preparedness for a public health emergency needs to address, not papers and guidelines and protocols, but action to remedy fundamental problems? Well, I think what's needed to prepare for a pandemic is, is first of all, you've got to have that overall economic capacity, um, as George Osborne puts in his statement, without our action, you could have had almost a trillion of extra debt. And you'd have, as well as a coronavirus crisis and a public health crisis, you'd have a um, financial and economic and, and, and fiscal crisis at the same time. Um, but I, I think the, the answer to your question is that um, the best way to prepare is to have a strong economy. And the next thing you need to do is prepare for all of the relevant pandemics that you might face. And we've already discussed um, where, you know, the system, I think, didn't spend enough time on the sorts of pandemic that we did end up facing. Do you accept, Mr Cameron, that the government was repeatedly warned about growing pressures on the NHS? Firstly, uh, from the Nuffield Trust annual statement in 2015, um, which detailed growing concerns that demand was outstripping capacity and, quote, the warning lights on care quality now glow even more brightly. And finally, in 2016, in the Nuffield Trust annual statement before you left office, which stated, slowing improvement in some areas of quality combined with longer waiting times and ongoing austerity suggests the NHS is heading for serious problems. It seems likely that a system under such immense pressure will be unable at some point in some services to provide care to the standards that patients and staff alike expect? Well, of course there were pressures on the NHS as there were pressures on many public services, but at the end of my time in office, um, I think public satisfaction with the National Health Service was still extremely high. Um, I think the King's Fund, it might have been, was ranking it as one of the most successful health systems in the 
world. We'd virtually abolished uh, mixed-sex wards. We'd got hospital infections down. We were carrying out 40% more diagnostic tests every week. There were successes in the NHS as well as pressures. But there are, you know, there are always pressures on these services. And uh, our job was to try and um, sort out the economy, which we did, so we could then have bigger increases in health spending, which then followed. In preparation for your evidence today, you were invited to consider the witness statement of Professor Kevin Fenton, uh, who is the president of the United Kingdom Faculty of Public Health, uh, which is a professional standards body for public health specialists and practitioners with over 4,000 members. Um, you will know then that, um, according to Professor Fenton, health protection teams saw successive reductions in funding and capacity over the pre-pandemic years and a lack of investment in regional emergency preparedness response and resilience teams. And the summary of his evidence, as provided to the inquiry so far in written form, is that there was no ring fencing of funding to local government for health protection, that health protection teams had their funding reduced and their capacity reduced, and that ultimately this resulted in a lack of capacity for pandemic preparedness. What's your response to that, please? Well, I read the Fenton report as the other reports. I, I thought... Um I, mean, I don't want to be too critical, but throughout all of them, I thought there was very little acceptance that it is possible to reform public sector organisations, uh, sometimes to merge them and get rid of duplicating bureaucracies and overheads and get more output for the same amount of money. I thought in, in Kershell, in Marmot, in, in Fenton, um, there was just this assumption that you only ever measure inputs rather than measuring outputs. So, for instance, I would say the creation of Public Health England, where a lot of, it was merging together a lot of other bodies, increased the focus on public health, meant money was spent more wisely. And I would argue also that the um, Health and Social Care Act, by putting public health into local authorities, that was the right place for it. Local authorities are responsible for housing and for education and for licensing. And so making them responsible for public health is, is very logical. And even... I think most of the experts coming to your inquiry, I don't think people are arguing to turn the clock back and put it into the health service. So I think these were good reforms. And yes, we faced very difficult financial circumstances, but where we could, we tried to encourage the spending of money more wisely, and sometimes the merging of public bodies was a sensible thing. But they don't seem to give that much credence. Well, you've mentioned the evidence of uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot and Professor Claire Bambra. Um, you've clearly read their report, and uh, you will know that they gave evidence to this inquiry on Friday. Do you accept their evidence, Mr Cameron, that health inequalities increased during your time in office? Well, I, I accept... I mean, I've read their reports. Yes. Um, uh, I accept that after um, 2011 in lots of countries in the world, uh, life expectancy continued to improve, but didn't continue to improve so quickly. Um, now, their conclusion is to look a lot at um, austerity and, and what have you. Uh, I'm not sure the figures back that out. Um, we had some very difficult winters with very bad uh, flu pandemics. I think that had an effect. We had. Uh, the effect that the improvements in cardiovascular disease, the big benefits had already come through uh, before that period, and that was tailing off. And then you've got the evidence from other countries. I mean, Greece and Spain um, had far more austerity, brutal cuts, and yet their life expectancy went up. So I don't think it, it, it follows. And I found, you know, I mean, there's one sentence in in. in Bamber and Marmot that just baldly says, you know, child poverty increased. Well, actually, the number of children living in absolute poverty went down. The number of people living in absolute poverty went down. The number of pensioners living in absolute poverty went down very considerably. So I... I so you don't, dis you don't I, agree with that? I, well, I mean, they've got lots of important evidence, and I, I've looked at it very carefully, and I will think about it very carefully, but I did find the... the I found, found that they had leapt to a certain set of... Um, conclusions quite quickly, not all of which was backed up by the um, evidence. And they don't mention the evidence that I've just mentioned, which I think is quite important. Um, I mean, added to the fact that uh, 
I agree with Professor Bamba that social and economic conditions have a big bearing on um, health inequalities, and so therefore the fact that there were 2.6 million more people in work, there were over half a million fewer children in households where no one worked, that these are, there were obviously a big dent in pensioner poverty because of the triple lock and the increase in the pension. Um, these are positives as well, which they don't seem to get mentioned in the same way. So I, I had my problems with them, but um, I'm sure the, the inquiry can look at, look at all the evidence and come to its conclusions. Do, do you accept that cuts to public health budgets tended to be largest in the most deprived areas, and that as a result, local authorities working with the most vulnerable populations faced the biggest challenges in carrying out their public health functions? No, I, I don't necessarily accept that. The way um, the local authority spending decisions were made was to try and make sure that the reductions in spending power in each local authority were broadly equivalent. And obviously, when you're looking at spending power, you've got to look at um, the grants uh, from central government to local government, the, the business rate um, revenue, and the council tax revenue. And so, for instance, I mean, I checked this last night, the 2015 settlement was for a a, a, no, no council should lose more than 6% of its spending power. Um, and so that does affect different councils in different way in terms of their grant, but it affects them in a more similar way when it comes to spending power. And it's obviously the spending power that a council yes. has that matters, and I think that's a better way of measuring it. All right, but were you aware <clears throat> whilst in government of evidence that people from lower social economic groups and minority ethnic groups would be more likely to be affected by whole system <laughs> catastrophic shocks? I think it was well known, and I knew that when you have health pandemics of any sort, um, you get differential effects on different parts of the population. Yes. I think as coronavirus turned out, the biggest um, um, category, uh, that's the wrong word, the biggest impact was obviously on o older people. But many of our policies were directed towards lifting people out of poverty, the, the more jobs. Um, the, the first national living wage, the big increase in the minimum wage, taking four million people out of paying income tax. All of these things, the reform, the universal credit, and the reform of welfare, and the whole effort of getting people out of welfare and into work, all of these things have an economic and social benefit, but also have a health benefit too. But the, the inquiry saw last Friday that pre-existing health inequalities only featured minimally in the UK pandemic planning. In fact, they were barely mentioned at all. Do you accept that this was a significant omission? I think all plans can be improved and updated, and I've read the evidence about that, and I'm sure future plans will. But if you're asking, was it, you know, was it, did you understand, um, did your government understand the importance of trying to lift people out of poverty and into work and into um, prosperity? Yes, absolutely. That's what the whole plan was about. And going back to this economic thing, because it is important, you know, over the period of my government in the G7, after America, we had fastest growth of GDP and fastest growth of GDP per head. So this is important because ultimately your health system is only as strong as your economy because one pays for the other. Do you agree that different political decisions will have to be made in the future if a strong public health system is to be nurtured to withstand another pandemic? I think Different decisions, well, I think we need to improve the way we look at pandemics and the way we plan our resilience, because while, as I've said, you know, the architecture was there, the structure was better, um, the involvement of ministers was better, um, the dialogue between ministers and civil servants was good, there is this gap that I keep coming back to, which is uh, how do we make sure that you're not subject to group things, that you don't plan for one type of pandemic because it's very current, it's very risky, it's very dangerous. You need to have teams going in to question uh, the assumptions. And I mean, the biggest one was this issue about asymptomatic transmission. I kept looking through all these documents, looking for what about uh, a pandemic with wide scale asymptomatic transmission. And if, if that question had been asked, then a lot of things would follow from that. You know, in Jeremy Hunt's evidence, hospitals in Hong Kong had to have three months of PPE supplies. I was never asked, can we have funding for three months PPE supplies for every hospital? But had I been asked, we would have granted it. It's, it's, that's not expensive. That's not a huge commitment. But that comes out of planning for the right sort of pandemic. So I, 
you know, all these questions about economic policy, we can have an argument about, was it the right economic policy or the wrong? I think it was the right economic policy, but the real problem was time spent quizzing the experts on what potential pandemics were coming um, and preparing for those in the right way and the questions that would follow from that. 